Uh, hi guys. Uh, this is weird. I'm standing <laughs> behind, <laughs> behind you guys. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe I'll introduce you. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead yes. Yeah, this is Omar Iqbal. I uh, hear yeah. that he was lecturing about Haska on NUS long before, long before I he I actually seen him. So there was this unknown Haskeller that was somewhere <laughs> beyond the horizon. <laughs> and then I actually heard he made a very passionate uh, talk on Haskell and actually theoretical uh, concepts yeah. behind it. So I know it was supposed to be talk about, you know, CocoJS yeah. and more like JavaScript, but since every s nearly every second sentence was, if it's good, it's almost like Haskell. Yeah, um, yeah it, I understood it very different way. I recommend his uh, talk on YouTube from the last geek camp. Mm -hmm. That was just two weeks ago or three yeah. weeks ago. Okay. And yeah, please. Okay. Okay, uh, so before I begin, like, uh, how many of, I just want to get an idea of the crowd, so like, how many of you guys uh, are intermediate Haskell programmers or understand, like, fully understand what monads are and what they're used for? <laughs> intermediate and above, intermediate and or huh? intermediate and well <laughs> Good question. Uh, let's just say not, let's just say how many of you are beginners in Haskell? Oh. Okay, that's good, very good. Because this talk, so originally I gave this talk to a more beginner friendly audience, so for more experienced people, this some of this stuff might be facepalm, or some of this stuff might be, oh God, goodbye, let me escape. So please bear with it. It's more of a beginner friendly talk, so I hope that's okay. All right, so let's get on with it. Uh, so this talk was, um, was about monadic parsers. Uh, I'm Omar, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, my day job is I work as an iOS developer at Garena. Once again, it might be surprising. What's in, what the hell is an iOS developer talking about this? I'll get to that. It's actually surprisingly relevant. Okay, so let's get to it. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a monad is, or probably first time uh, saw, saw a monad, or probably wondering why is a parser related to a monad, your reaction is probably something like this, and it's understandable. Uh, we'll get to that. But before we get to that, we're first going to discuss parsers uh, are, and we're going to try to define parsers or define the problems problem that we're trying to solve here. So a long time ago, and we're going to start with the story, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, our dot Twitter wants to parse JSON data sets of rebel starships. All right. Uh, it's a quite a typical use case. Uh, problem is, he can't download his favorite JSON library because internet access is a little scanty these days on the Death Star. So he says, damn it, I'll make my own. So he wants to implement his own JSON parsing library from scratch. And this sort of thing, like, he thinks, okay, should be quite straightforward, should be quite easy to do. Uh, we got regex, right? I mean, it's a great parsing tool. Everyone who's parsed anything of some, uh, anyone who's parsed like some simple user validation stuff, anyone who's parsed like some simple stuff, even some things like more complex things like CoffeeScript compiler, for example, these things will use regex. So this thing might just work, right? And here's a quote I found on the internet, which is kind of true. It says, some people when confronted with the problem will think, hey, I'll use regular expressions. And now they have two problems. And this is by this guy, Jimmy Zawinski, he's a pretty famous hacker. Uh, it's not my invention. What's the problem with regex? Right, this is a great tool, but you shouldn't use it for parsing non-regular languages. And I'm not gonna go into the mathematical definition exactly of what a regular language or a non-regular language exactly is, but just to give you guys an intuitive idea of what a regular language is, you can think of it in a way that a regular language is a finite language in the sense that the permutations that the alphabet can have is in a finite manner. Uh, just so like something like a date is a regular language, but something like a programming language or something like JSON is not a regular, it's not a regular language. I have a very small proof here, like why JSON, HTML, and most programming languages are not regular languages. Uh, wait a second, and that proof is not appearing here. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, never mind. You're gonna use the pumping lemma? Huh? You're gonna <laughs> use the pumping lemma? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, it's, a much, it's a much simpler proof. But the basic idea here is that, uh, just like, I'll just give the basic idea why it's not a 
why it's not a regular language. Oops. For those of you who are who use like better programming environments, don't like don't judge. I'm using Sublime <laughs> because my Emacs setup crapped out on me. So okay, the can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. So one like simple proof on why it's not a regular language is any language of this form. Uh, sorry, I'm using this. A n b n where where n is greater than equal to zero and goes on infinite is not a regular language. A where a and b are mem are your alphabet basically. Of, so any language of this form and there's a proof behind this is not a regular language. And if you think about it, a simple proof by case. This is a just valid JSON, and you could have infinitely many brackets here, right? It will still be a valid JSON. This is the same form as this because I can make this bracket equal to A, this bracket equal to B, and therefore proving them, hence the proving that JSON is not a regular language. Simple proof, right? Uh, if there's more complex proofs, more complex papers out there. Feel free to look at them. Anyways, back to my slides. Uh, so. Point here is JSON, HTML, and most programming languages are not regular languages. Okay, so we're gonna help Vader out of here. We're gonna help Vader out a bit, and I'm gonna start with a simple parse. So, what, and the way we're gonna help Vader out first is first we're gonna define a very uh, simple grammar for JSON. All right, and it's not gonna be an accurate grammar. So here's a very very simple grammar for JSON. Uh, like this is actually wrong, but hey, it's 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 okay. That's our for that's our purposes. So let's just say JSON can be a bool, a string literal, a num literal, a null array object. Boolean can be true or false. String literal can be this stuff. A number. Let's say we already define what a number is. Null can be this. An array. Then here's where it comes recursive. An array can be JSON followed by more JSON and comma. A, a pair can be string literal followed by colon followed by more JSON and an object is just. Uh, zero or more pairs, right? It's a very simple uh, grammar for JSON. And I'm going to implement, an or, or other, I've already implemented a parser using which, I'll just show you guys, uh, which looks something like this. Uh, so the basic gist of it is, uh, this is, by the way, this is a. This is not using parsec or anything. This is like something I developed myself, and I'll show you guys how to develop something like this. It's quite a simple parsing library. But the basic gist of it is that the grammar rules over here look a lot like my grammar rules I specified over here. So if you look at the code, what's in my, for example, in my parse JSON, what I do is I parse either parse bool or parse string or parse number, etc. My parse bool, I parse for this literal, otherwise I parse for this. And I'm returning stuff that belongs to t this type, which is basically the type of my AST. This is the return type of, of what this parser will return to me after parsing. And like the basic gist of the idea here is that this parser looks a lot like the grammar I specified on this side. And if you use something like parsec, this would probably not at all be very impressive. Side note, how many of you have used Parsec before? That's a lot of people. OK, great. Then this will not look impressive at all. But the fun part will be that we can implement this quite easily. Uh, OK, so and okay, just to show you guys, just to prove that this thing works, just going to run it with some stuff. For example, so let's do this. It returns a null. If we give it an array, it returns this thing. Uh, bear in mind, this grammar is faulty because it doesn't deal with floating points. But that's OK. I think that star doesn't need floating points for now. So uh, given that sort of thing, just, let's just go through like how we came up with that sort of simple parsing library that we can build from scratch. And, and the way we're going to go there is we're first going to define what a parser is. So. In simple word, instead of, if you think about it simply, a parser is just a function that takes a string and it'll return to you something of type A, which is your return type or the value you want from that parser, and the remaining string. So it will return to you a tuple of these two things. A very simple I think that's a very simple thing of what a parser like would, would do, right? And that's it. Uh, however, the there's a problem with this definition, and that problem is that one, 
I may not be able to successfully parse everything from, uh, from a string. So let's say I give an invalid input, in which case I can't find anything. My first definition can't encapsulate that in the type system, right? Similarly, if I have an ambiguous grammar, I might have multiple results from the same input string. So in order to encapsulate these two cases in my type system, instead what I'll do is I'll return a list of tuples uh, of type A and of type A and string. So I can have multiple results. And using this clever technique, basically my empty list would mean that my parser failed. And if I have multiple, it means I have like it's an ambiguous grammar and I had I have multiple results after parsing. Okay. So Next thing we're gonna we're gonna do here is oh sorry, we're gonna define a new type called parser. This and this takes a generic type A, and we have a type constructor that takes this function string to basically the same function that we defined earlier, and that's it. So we define it as a type, uh, encapsulating this encapsulating this function as a type, where as I said before, empty list means failure. And this is basically a list of re a result of type A and the remaining string. And that's, that's it. We're done defining a parser. So what can we do with it? Yeah, as I mentioned, multiple case. Okay, so let's define our, using this type definition, let's define our first parser. And let's, what the parser is gonna do is, it's gonna consume the first character in a given in a, in a given list of input, and it's going to return just that character. Okay, so it'll consume. By consume, I mean that it'll it'll in the remaining string, it'll give you everything but that first character, and the value it returns is going to be the first character. So, and here's how I implement it. It's quite simple. It's just a, its type is a parser of type car because the return type is car, and it just uh, and here's the parsing function. It just does a case case. Uh, just as a pattern, chip, pattern match with the string. If the string is empty, empty list. Because, and remember, empty list is failure, so it means if you give it an empty empty string, this parser would fail. Otherwise, it'll just return to you the first element of that list, of, of first, first uh, character of the string. So, uh, quite a simple parser. It's quite useless, too. Let's see what more we can do with it. Also, if I, wanna, if I just want to apply this parser on some input, I'll just unwrap the parsing function and apply it on a string like this. So I can define a parse function to unwrap my parsing function and apply it. So quite straightforward again. So uh, now here's where the fun stuff begins. Uh, in isolation, this is not very interesting, but let's say we want the ability to bind two parsers together. And what I mean by that is I want, I want oh shit, what is that? Okay. Connect, lose connection, I think. All right. Okay. So let's say I want the ability to bind two parsers together. So I want to chain the parser such that the result of my first parser is fed into a function that takes that result and produces a new parser. And in this way, I can combine multiple parsers together or bind them together, so to speak. Right? And like, how would I? Or how let's let's say I, I, I ha, let's say I, I, I have this need and the way I implement it is and if you look at the type definition of bind it's gonna it's gonna take a parser it's gonna take a function that takes the same return type as the beginning parser and it's gonna return to you a parser B so we have this binding function and this whole thing returns to you a parser of type B and in the implementation of this we have three steps uh, so we basically create a we basically create a parser. This parsing function, remember, will return to you a parser of type B, as the type definition says. So this this so this this parsing function will return to you something of type B, and this function will take your string. What it does is it first applies the first parser, parser P, our first parser. It will apply that parser on the original string. Then it will. It, and this thing will give you a result of applying. So this thing will be a result. This thing will be a list of a and string, right? It'll give you a list of a and a list of and and your remaining string. The next thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a map. Just do a map and a, and parse. So my function f, remember, this is the function f 
This function returns to me a new parser after I give it some input. Sorry guys. That's okay. This function gives me a new parser after I give it so give it some input of type A, right? So I will apply that new parser I get with the remaining with the remaining string I got from uh, from the applying the first parser. So I and this and this stuff will basically give me a list of type B and string, right? Because I'm applying the second parser and and the second parser's result type is this. So I get a list of and a list of A and B of B and oh sorry of B and string and then I just flatten the result out to get this nice result. So that's what bind is doing. And in isolation, it might not seem very useful for why I'm doing this, but we'll get, we'll get to how this is useful. One more thing you need to bear in mind here is how the failure case is handled. So if at any step, so let's say my first parser fails. If my first parser fails, the list I pass to the map is gonna be an empty list, right? And if you apply a map on an empty list, you're still gonna get an empty list. So my empty list is gonna get propagated throughout. So in case my parser P, fails to consume anything and gives me nothing, the whole thing will, will end up being an empty list, which is fine, which means I'm, I'm, par I'm passing the failure case throughout. Hey, Omar. Yeah. Is that binary operator flip composition or what? Yeah, it's okay. So the binary operator is a flip composition. Uh, good point out. I prefer, I pref visually, I prefer chaining or composing uh, functions using this operator because it shows you the steps in order. In um, control dot arrow. Sir? Which yeah, correct. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. I define this myself usually, so but thanks. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so far so good. Yeah. As I said, in case of failure, empty list is propagated down, which is great. So I define bind, and now I need, now I'll define another function called unit. And what unit will do is unit will take any value and it'll just produce a parser from that value that consumes nothing and just returns that value. And this may seem useful, but it's actually quite useful when we get, when we get to why it's actually quite useful. But essentially what it's doing is it's taking something and putting it just in, putting it inside the parser, parser type, which, I mean, and, it's, and the implementation we look at is quite simple. It just, it just takes something of type A and just return to you a parsing function that just returns some, that something of type A in a list, in a list, and the same string, so it doesn't it doesn't actually consume anything, uh, and that's it. So using these two <laughs> functions, right, uh, <coughs> we can actually do a bunch of interesting things. And some of you who aren't familiar or haven't figured out what I'm going towards, uh, why am I talking about unit? Probably doing this right now, which is just a justifiable. So which begins the next part: parser combinators which is where, this, where, where we're gonna apply this concept. So let's def, let, so with parser combinators, what we're gonna, we're gonna try doing is, we're gonna try combining simple parsers together to form more complex parsers, using bind and unit as our two fundamental operations. And let's define the first combinator that we're gonna implement. It's called satisfies. And satisfies will just take a predicate and it will return a parser that'll consume the first character if that predicate succeeds, it'll fail otherwise. And the way we're gonna implement this using our nice binary unit is just like this, right? It satisfies, it takes a predicate function, and we bind it to item, which we defined previously. So item will take your first character from your string, which we, and we defined this earlier. Since the return type of item is a character, in my binding function over here, this uh, C, the type of the type of C is going to be a is going to be a is going to be a character. I apply a, I apply the predicate on character. So if this predicate succeeds, then I will return unit C. Unit C, as we defined earlier, is going to it's going to it's just going to return to you a parser that does nothing but contains returns this value, right? Otherwise, we'll fail. So this is just a failure case of parser that parser that just returns an empty list for any given input. So what this thing is doing is simply it'll, it'll consume first character it'll, and it'll check against the predicate. If the predicate succeeds, it'll carry on parsing. So, and here's where we enter the monad. 
Uh, and here's where things get interesting. So, as it turns out, bind and unit, surprise, surprise, are some are, are common abstractions we have in Haskell. And if you look at the type definition of, of bind, or, or, uh, so in in the Haskell type monad type class, we have two functions, right? And if you as long as you implement these two functions, you are technically a monad, right? Because, and that's how type classes work. I mean, there are there's obviously monad rules, but we're not going to get into that. But what I want you to look at is in these two in these two functions that we're supposed to implement to be called a monad. If just look at their type definitions and compare them to the type definition of bind and unit that we defined earlier. So if you look at return, uh, just swap a with parser. Just swap say so just swap m with parser, and it's the same thing, right? Similarly, for this funny arrow looking operator that is called bind. Uh, if you just swap m with parser, we get the same thing as we've already implemented in bind, right? So turns out this sort of this sort of operations or combined doing these sort of higher order operations is quite a common thing and has and Haskell has a type class called monad to encapsulate uh, this very concept. So let's make our parser an instance of this type class, or let's say it, or in other words, it implements this type class. Or if you're from, if you're from the object, if you're from an object-oriented world, wait a second, let me just close Slack. I think that's what's causing this. Sorry, sorry guys. Okay. So if you're from, if you're from an object-oriented world, you can think of type class as sort of like a protocol that, or a, a constraint on your type. And as long as you implement these two, these two, uh, the, as long as you implement the functions <coughs> that you're supposed to, uh, you will be someone implementing that protocol. If you want to think of it as an object in an object-oriented way, so sim our implementation of, of so do you implement parser and make it a monad? It's quite simple. We just make return equal to unit, which will work, and this funny-looking operator equal to bind, and we're done here. So our parser is now a monad, quite simply. Which means that instead of using bind and unit, we can just use these two functions. Hooray, we've done a lot. And some, and once again, like this is nothing special by itself, right? So here's where the fun part comes in, or here's why the, where the advantage of making it a monad comes in, really. Uh, typically, when you write parsers using uh, this thing, using this, funny looking bind operator, you'll probably have something like this, where you apply your, let's say you have a parser, and you bind it to this function. This is the result you get from that parser. Then you continue parsing, so you apply a second parser, you get another result, you do you continue on n times, and then you probably have some function where you, where you, a uh, function where you construct some semantic value using the results of the parsing that you did earlier, right? That's what you would typically do in a parser, and this is what your code would generally look like if you uh, up build your parser using this operator. Uh, turns out Haskell has some Haskell has a nice syntactic sugar for this, so we can we can add some do syntax, and then the, what the do syntax does is it's quite simple, just flip the operations, so instead of uh, a1, so basically what this what this says is that it'll bind, it'll ap apply parser p1 and bind it to this value, a1. So basically just in your mind, you just think of it as syntactic sugar and you just flip this around and you don't need the arrow, arrow, arrow anymore. It's just some nice syntactic sugar to write the same thing. But the flow of your parser becomes quite clear because of this. So I I'm apply parser 1, I get this value, apply parser 2, get this value, then I apply my semantic action. Same thing. But the syntactic sugar makes writing parsers a lot simpler. And that's all it's doing. So just to clarify this a bit, I'm going to define a new parser. This parser will take three characters and throw the second character and just return to us a tuple of the other two characters, the first and the third character. So let's just define this parser. And we're first going to define it using our bind an item. And the way this parser works is, I bind, I, I apply my item parser, which we defined earlier once again. Item takes the first character, right, from a string, and if the string is empty, it'll just fail and propagate failure throughout. And I get my first character of the string out from it. So I, and this, and I bind it to this function, 
Then I apply another bind where I apply item again and get the second character out. I apply the third time, get the third character out. And finally, because this in this in this parser, I want to return a parser of type car car. I will just apply a unit operation to convert my result or to or to wrap my result in a parser type and I and I wrap it with the first and the third character, ignoring my second second character. So that's how I will write write a simple parser using my using the constructs that we defined earlier. Uh, this is a nicer version of this. I can write using the simple arrow operator. Uh, so yeah, the same thing, just swap bind with this funny operator and just ignore, we don't, we don't care about second, so just don't give it a variable name. Lastly, you can write, write it like this, using do syntax. So we take the first guy, first character out, we apply, it, we apply item again, take the third character out, voila, simple write. Just apply do syntax to write our second part, throw a second parser. So that done, we can use this sort of thing to define more combinators and write, may, and use those to construct a more powerful parser for some to parse something capable of parsing JSON, for example. So we're going to define a new parse new combinator. It's called M plus. All right. And what M plus does is it takes two parsers that have the same return type and will return to you another parser. Basically, combining the results from the two from the two parts. So, if you look at the implementation, all it's doing is it's concatenating the list of results we get from applying parser p and applying parser q. So, it's nothing short of just concatenating the two results. In a sense, adding or plusing the two parsers together. And in a way, if you think about it, you can think about it also. It's sort of like saying, okay, apply parser p or apply parser q. Because once again, if either of my parser fails, it's an empty list, right? So and if I and what it's saying is okay, either apply p or apply q, and just return to me the results of applying them both. So you can think of it; it's sort of like an or, sort of like an or operation as well. Let's make another version of this. Similarly, let's call it option. What option does is it just applies m plus, but gives us the first result, which is usually what which. And the reason why this is this particular operator is useful is because it says give me results from p exclusively or q exclusively, so which is quite use which is quite useful in a part if you when you think about it if you're doing if you're making a parser and you're and you want to have uh, and you want to branch out and you have different branches in your parser then this sort of operator is quite useful. So once again, what this will so. Even though M plus will actually parse apply both P and Q, if P fail if P fails and Q has result Q has a result, you still get the Q will still get Q's, Q's result because Q's result will be the first element of this list. If P fail P succeeds, Q fails, same logic. If they both fail, we get an empty list. So that's how option works. Quite simple, right? Similarly, let's define an operator that just takes a car and this will, will consume it, will basically continue parsing if it sees that character. Otherwise, it will fail. And we just use we just use our satisfies operator we defined earlier, and we just apply the satisfies operator with equal with with this with this predicate function. So, so we have now we now have a function that we can we can use to uh, parse uh, parse a particular literal car. Similarly. If you want to take a string, if you want to parse a particular literal, literal string, we can define a new parser, something something like this, which, when parsing an empty list, will return an empty list. Will return meaning it will return to you a parser uh, with this em with, with this empty list. Otherwise, otherwise, what it will do is it'll use the car parser we defined earlier. It'll apply the car, and then it'll recursively call string this 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 parser again. On the on the on the on the remaining part of the string, right? So in the base, so at the end of it, when the when we have the last character, we'll this we'll get this case, and which will return to us an empty empty string. So on the whole, this whole thing will return to you the string itself that you know that you were checking against. So the nice thing over here to note is we can define parses recursively, which is quite powerful. 
Similarly, we're going to define two more parsers called many and many one. So what many will do is many will apply a parser p zero or more times and many one will apply a parser one or more times. And we can define them in a mutually recursive manner by saying, okay, many p is basically many one p. So apply parser p at least one, at least once or more times or return an empty list, which is bear in mind, this is not failure. This is just, this is just a parser with contain, containing an empty list. Because if you look at the type definition of this parser, it's a parser that returns to you a, a list of type A. So empty list here means that your many was applied zero times, which is fine for us. Many one on the other hand, what it does is it'll apply parser P first, it'll take the result in A, then it'll apply many and uh, put the result in a, in A's and it'll just it'll just bind the result it'll just return the result by a, by concatenating by uh, making this a list of the two stuff that of the two things that you got. So basic point here is we can define this parser in a nice mutually recursive manner, and these parsers are pretty powerful because they allow us to apply a parser more than once. So. And like when I and when I read this in the paper, so basically a lot of this, most of this stuff is not my invention. This stuff I read in a paper written by Eric Meyer. Uh, it's quite a nice paper. I highly recommend you guys read it as well. It's linked to the thing. But when I came across this in the paper, I my this was literally my reaction because I realized okay, this is actually quite simple to implement this. Anyways, so let's so lastly, let's say I want to parse write a parser for a simple language that basically is com composed of uh, mathematical expressions like this, like seven plus five or this sort of expression, right? Let's say I wanna write a simple parser that parses this kind of stuff from scratch. How would I get, get around doing it? Uh, I'll show you guys. So like the way, how, so the way I would get around doing it is we will first define some simple parsers and let's define the grammar for this sort of, this, for this kind of language. First thing we're going to define is something that can parse white space for us because white space is quite annoying. There's and we can have arbitrarily many white spaces in between, right? So our parser for white space, and let's call it space. The way it works is it's just a parser with return type string, and it'll just consume many instances of this predicate is space. And I define is space simply as something that something that'll take a space a new line character or a type character, otherwise it'll always return false. So basically zero or more applications of his space uh, or satisfy this space will return, will basically uh, be your space space parser, which is great. Next thing I'm gonna define are my tokens for this particular grammar. In this case, a token, I define it. So I define a token as a, par as a parser that takes another parser and applies and basically parses the space around that around that around that thing and it'll just return to me something that something before a space right that's a token in this simple language so in this particular case i apply my parser p put the result in a and I, then i apply a space i don't care about the results of the space so i throw the result away and i return to you this thing in a, this thing the result a wrapped in a parser this thing is token so similarly, although in this particular language I don't have symbols, I can define a parser for a symbol. And a symbol, all it does is it's a token with this string, uh, the two parts that parses this string. Similarly, I can define a parser for a digit, and a digit is just something that applies uh, Haskell's is digit function, cheating here a bit. And a number is just one or more digits. And and I just apply use Haskell's read function to parse this because did this uh, digit returns to me a character if you notice, so I just use uh, Haskell's and this thing will return to me uh, an array of cards with a string. So I use Haskell's read to convert that into an int. So this this number will parse parse an int, and uh, that's it. So with these tokens, I can define um, a complex grammar like I mentioned earlier using something like this. I can define my expression 
to be anything to be a parser of type int. I can define an add operation as a parser that takes mm -hmm. this uh, that takes another operator, uh, takes a binary operator int int and returns int, and a multiplication operation same type signature. And the way this parser is implemented is I have this operator. I'll get to the implementation of this operator soon. But basically, anything in my expression can be a term or it can be an add operation. A term is a factor fo followed by a multi multiplication operation. And a factor is just a number, either a number or it's something in between, or it's an expression in a bracket. And this expression returned. So if you think about it, it looks a lot, this, this kind of code looks a lot like <coughs> the grammar that you actually would write for this kind of language, right? And I define my add operation simply as uh, something, can, something that can be either uh, surrounded by a plus or surrounded by a minus. And my multiplication operation is either multiplication or, or uh, division. And the reason I deal with them, deal with these two things separately is because I want to follow the precedence rules that multiplication is applied first and addition is applied later on. What happens in this operator is, well, uh, I'll just show you guys the source code for this. Oh, sorry. Where is it? Okay. Uh, oops, wrong file. There is it. Okay, I'll show you guys, show it to you in a bit. Ah, here we go. So, in my chain L1 operator, all I'm doing is I take a parser of type A. I take another parser that takes a function that map that takes two things of type A and returns to you uh, something of type A. So it's a, it's a basically it's a binary operator. Some in our case this will be plus minus multiplication division, and it'll return to you something of a parser of type A. And the basic gist of this is that this function will parse things around my operator. That's all it's doing to get an intuitive idea of how it works. It's just parsing stuff that is around my operator. So with these two, with, with, this, with this thing, I, I can construct this simple looking grammar. And I'll just show you guys whether this thing works. So uh, I call it, so here's the parser that I wrote. Uh, load this module so there we go that's how it works so I do a more complex thing there so you can see like this sort of grammar it can parse this sort of grammar quite easily and that's that's all the amount of code that you have to write for implementing this kind of simple parser right and that's so that's it for parser combinators now, for those of you wondering, for those of you who write parsers, like this is not obviously the only way to parse things. We have parser generators, which are, you can say more, which, which do, and the way those work are quite, is, quite, is quite different. You provide them a grammar and they will generate a parser implementation for you. And Haskell has some parser generators. So it's not the only way to parse stuff. But uh, it's an interesting way of thinking about parsers. And it, it's an interesting way of thinking about how parsers combined with monads can make can be used to make a pretty powerful, powerful parsers at the end of the day. Side note, uh, Parsec is in, the way Parsec works is pretty similar to the implementation of the simple Parsec parameter library I showed you guys earlier. Parsec works similarly, but it's a lot more, it, ha, it deals with a lot more things like error handling, it's a lot more performant. So for real world projects, obviously, please use Parsec. It's a lot better, it's, a lot, it's really powerful. Uh, and that's more or less, yeah, that, that's, that's actually it. Lastly, like the reason why this is kind of relevant to me as an iOS developer originally, uh, so I'm an iOS developer, but I have, a, I have a lot of enthusiasm for Haskell. So in our, at work, we faced this problem where we needed to generate Objective-C classes and from parsing uh, mm. protobuf, config, uh, protobuf specification files. So we needed to write a parser for por for proto files, and I wrote this. I wrote a parser for the proto files using uh, using Parsec, and it was a pretty nice experience. Uh, 
and I read this paper around the same time, so I was pretty impressed by what we could do with parsers in Haskell and how, and how simple they were to implement using monads. So this is just a project I did, and it was quite useful, and that's how the iOS thing is slightly kind of relevant in a way. Yeah. Uh, that's the end. Any questions? Yeah. So I think it's worth noting that the, the one thing that you didn't touch on is why is that your example doesn't need monadic parsing. So why would you use a monadic parser combinator? I mean, the both the expression parser and the JSON parser, yeah. y you can see if you look at that you only use the applicative structure of of your parser type. Correct. Yeah, that's true. So why would in, in these cases, okay, I guess my real point is it needs to be a conscious choice to go with monadic parsing instead that of an applicative one. That's because, correct. of course, if you make an applicative parser, you can exploit all that static knowledge that you get there to make a much more performant implementation of applying it, right? Because you, know, you can compute like uh, starting sets, like which are the characters, which can possibly be accepted as first oh, characters. Okay, yeah, right. so, right. so, so don't jump into monadic parsing just because parsec is one. That's a good point. It needs to be a conscious decision yeah. if you really need monadic power or if applicative is enough. That's a very good point, actually. And the, the, yes. and the good example of this, actually, is there's a applicative regular expression parser yeah. library on Hackage, which allows you to parse regular languages. So it wouldn't work for your examples, yeah. but it allows you to parse regular ran languages in the, sa in the same applicative interface. So you don't get you know some string, or, or it's it's not like you know when, when in most programming languages when you apply a regex for something, you either get like a, a single bit of whether it matched, mm -hmm. or you get you know like a dictionary of um, <coughs> what are they called these capture groups yeah, and their values, yeah, right? But but uh, but with applicative regular expression parsers, you you can <coughs> yeah you can have some kind of structure inside your parser. So just like how your That's parser okay. doesn't return a tree yeah. to you, right? Yeah. It just does something yeah. while it builds up that tree, yeah. right? The Correct. Correct. tree Correct. is implicit. Correct. So the same can be done with regular expressions. And what you get is something which, you know, which parses in linear time, like you would expect of a regular expression parser, but still allows you to do meaningful uh, Combina combination, the mi meaningful composition of you know, sub parser. I see, I see, I see. That's a very good point, actually. The reason why this thing uses monads is actually the reverse. The tutorial I or the paper I originally read was more of uh, uh, how to apply monads in a particular problem domain. So how do how we can apply monads in parsers? So the reason why monads came into this is more of a example, this is how you use a monad. So that's that's the main reason, no, that's the only reason actually for why monads are brought into this in the first place. It's not a, I agree it's not a, it's from, um, like a use, from a use, usability point of view, applicator makes more sense, I think, you're right. But this one is more of a kind of a monad tutorial-ish thing. So it's like, oh, we can use monads to build parsers together. That's oh, th okay. That's what monads are. This right, mythical thing I, I called monads. I guess the point I want to make yeah. is that none of the examples actually use monads for that. All the combinators you use only use the applicative structure, which okay, is I think that's important true. for that's true, that's true. the newbies to, to, to recognize instead of that's actually a good point. Yeah. That's, that's a good point actually. Yeah. In, in the case of JSON, don't you actually need a monadic parser? That's uh, actually very uh, fine. I mean, the so okay, the the code that we saw here didn't take care of that. That's true. I right. So it. so I, I'm talking strictly about the the implementation we saw here. I, I didn't read the JSON parser. Right? I I read the math parser. Yeah. Well, right, that's given the motivating problem. But that's, 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 that's a good example as also because yeah, th that 
I mean, the language then becomes context sensitive, right? So with some hand waving, you could prove that you're not going to be able to parse that using an efficacy parser, using a finite efficacy <coughs> parser, simply because the, the grammar is too complicated for that. Yes. I mean, at this point, I I'm actually puzzled how many uh, JSON libraries out there will actually give you a pass error on it if you can hear, not just take the second, the second occurrence. What is ace one do? Uh, what almost assume maybe second occurrence, but I, I'm re would really be interested to try that, right? Is it even in the right, right? I would assume question. JavaScript will happily accept that because JSON comes from JavaScript. Maybe that's <coughs> really right. the JSON is well specified. Yeah. 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 Y